Welcome to season six of the RAG podcast. Now, for those of you who don't know, the RAG stands for Recruitment Agency Growth. And this show has been around since early 2019. And every week, we are obsessed with finding out how the world's most successful and innovative recruitment agencies and their founders have got to where they are today. In season six, alongside the founder's story and the inside information of that business, I also want to focus on the reality of today's economy. There is so much noise about this inevitable recession that we find ourselves in right now. And where it's going to go, is it really having an impact on the recruitment sector? Are they seeing any change in job flow? Are they seeing any change in candidate control or activity? What is going on? I want to find out. So every single week, I want to forget the propaganda, forget the noise. I'm going to speak to a real life recruitment owner and find out what is going on in their business. I will bring it to you every single Wednesday from 12 o'clock across multiple platforms. Stay tuned. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the RAG podcast on this week's show. I'm joined by James Emmett, the CEO and founder of Hanover Group. Um, I've recently interviewed uh, Anthony Pitt, also um, one of the directors over at uh, Hanover, one of the vice presidents of the USA. Um, and I also wanted to get the, the original founder on, on, on the show because James started the business 27 years ago. Uh, with a business partner who he bought out in 2014 um, and has now grown the organization to 100 people across multiple locations, transatlantic, UK, Europe, USA. Um, and at 60 years old, he's still got the energy to continually grow. He's been buying or acquiring small recruitment businesses and bolting them into the organization. And he talks at length in this episode about his buy and build strategy. So I think this is going to be super important for you to listen to if you're the type of organization that wants to grow and potentially go through a buy and build strategy yourself, or you're a small recruitment organization that might actually be interested in being acquired in the future. And what are the benefits, pros and cons to the whole process? So without further ado, James, welcome to the RAG podcast. Sean, sure, thank you very much. It's a, it's a pleasure and um, very nice to meet you in, in person. Great to have you on. James, we, um, we spoke recently after I had Anthony on the show. Um, what I'd love to do is, obviously, we want to tell a, a slightly different version of the Hanover story today from, from your perspective, the founder. But before we get into it, do us a favor and um, just give us the bird's eye overview of you and the business today. Yeah, no problem. Um, Hanover Search Group now is... Um approaching three decades old the business was founded in uh in 1996 um i remember the day very well because it was uh, it was actually the day uh, after my youngest daughter was born so um 12th of uh, april 1996 um we were we've grown very very rapidly over the last of the last uh 15 or 20 years um we're very transatlantic now in in, in the way that we operate so we have offices in london new york chicago uh, LA, um, one up in Vermont for some reason, I'm not really sure why. Uh, and our real area of expertise is uh, executive search talent solutions across uh, financial services, specifically insurance, wealth, asset management, uh, banking, fintech, insurtech, private equity are our main areas of, um, uh, of operation. Uh, we've made four or five smaller acquisitions um, over the last four, four, four or five years. And we're now around 100 staff uh, with a circa 20 million uh, turnover. Amazing. Amazing. And that's 27, 28 years of, of, of growth, right? That's correct. Yeah. Um, wow. it's, uh, it's been a real journey. And I think, um, you know, there's really sort of two parts to that story, Sean. Uh, one is, um, uh, my original business partner and I uh, both started life with, uh, with a, a previous, um, uh, client of yours, a gentleman called James Khan, Alexander yeah. Mann. Yeah. Um, back in the early 90s when uh, we didn't really have computers and things were very different. Uh, and um, uh, Patrick and I had a vision to, to build um, you know, an FS boutique. Um, and James at that time was starting to go down the, the IT contract route. And um, I think probably in the short term, he got it right, we got it wrong. But nonetheless, we, we moved away and set up Hanover. <clears throat> and um, the first... Uh, 18 years of that journey were very much focused, you know, on being an FS boutique in the UK. Yeah. Uh, and um, uh, we had a lot of fun. Um, 
nice offices in Covent Garden uh, and then in Cannon Street. But uh, we were very much a UK focused business, um, doing around four or five million a year, sort of a mid, a mid tier type firm. Um, and, um, you know, that all changed in 2014. Right. <laughs> through all that. So looking at your background originally, was it, am I right in believing you were an, an independent financial advisor before a recruiter? Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, you're going way back to a former life now. So um, I, I started uh, life in uh, 1981, my, my, um, my working life, uh, working in um, an FS sales role. So this is probably, uh, you know, long before your time, Sean, but um, um, in those days, um, selling life and pensions was a, was a, was a tough business. Uh, and uh, I wasn't um, particularly academically bright. Uh, I didn't go to university, um, uh, even though my father spent a fortune on my education. Um, mm -hmm. But um, I, I enjoyed selling um, and um, I worked for a, a, a small firm uh, in Farringdon. Um, selling financial services and uh, very, very quickly realized that um, I was quite entrepreneurial. And I think I set my first um, FS sort of wealth management um, business up when I was 22. Wow. So you, you, you mentioned your dad spent a fortune on your, on your education. What, was, what did your dad do growing up? Oh, my dad was a banker um, in international finance. Uh, my, my mom was very entrepreneurial and, um, she uh, she's still around. Uh, unfortunately, my dad isn't. But um, um, my mum's in her mid eighties now. She uh, she's always been um, into the uh, teaching and school. She set up her own school um, when she was in her late fifties, actually, uh, in Fulham Fulham Prep School. Um, still around today. She still works there a couple of days a month, even in her mid eighties. No so um, she wow. was a big source of inspiration for me. Yeah, so I like to say that. <laughs> I'm always fascinated by you know. Where does entrepreneurial spirit come from, right? And so, if you look at your upbringing, do you think it was a case of mirroring or, or learning from your parents and looking at their careers? I wasn't really conscious of that, Sean. You know, I, you know, I was, um, I was probably a sort of very arrogant, cocky, confident uh, young lad, um, and, and I always felt very safe. And my parents had given me, you know, good values, and uh, um, you know, I, I was, I was in, in a position, I guess, where I could take risks. Uh, you know, the downside for me, you know, wasn't going to be, you know, living on the streets. And I, yeah. of course, that is the case for a lot of people. So I was very privileged from that perspective. But they certainly weren't um, wealthy by any means. They'd worked very hard uh, to send me to, you know, to uh, to a boarding school. Um, uh, that's why my mum went back to teaching. Um, but, you know, they instilled in me, you know, good values, good work ethic. And um, and as I said, I, I, you know, I enjoyed taking the risk and, you uh, in the early years, you know, I got it wrong more often than I got it right. Fair. I think we, I think, I think we can all say the same on that front. So, without going into the full story, then, what, what, how did you get from financial advising into recruitment? Uh, yeah, I, I worked in FS for for about a about a decade. You know, I, I ran um, my my own uh, financial services sales business um, from a, the sort of mid to late eighties. Uh, and, and again, you know, this would be sort of long before you and, and many of your listeners before before they were uh, working. But um, yeah. there was a big stock market crash in the late 80s. And we were doing a lot of work uh, selling unit trusts online. And that literally sort of dried up overnight. Um, and at that point in time, I, I decided that, you know, I, you know, I had to look for something else. Um, and, I, and I reconnected with with James. James um, uh, Khan had actually been the internal recruitment manager for the firm I first worked for. Um, again, many people may not know that, but uh, this is before he started Alexander Mann. But yeah. uh, by the late 80s, he was doing pretty well. And I, I reached out to him, you know, in 80, 88, 89, 90, um, and um, decided that I wanted to use the experience that I had in financial services. You know, I, I understood the mindset. Um, I liked sales. Uh, I was pretty good at it. And, um, you know, what James was doing back in the early 90s was was right up my street. You know, we, we were taking sort of an exec search proposition to the masses. Um, he was doing a lot in, in FS. He was working with a lot of the clients that I knew well, people like, you know, uh, Jay Rothschild Associates, Allied Dunbar and so on. So, so I went to work for him. And then was it about three, four years you were with, with Alexander Mann? Until 96. Yeah. And... When did you know you were going to launch your own recruitment firm? Can you remember that moment or 
the, the series of events that led to you going, well, let's go and do it ourselves? Um, I think, I think I'd, you know, as I'd run, I'd run my business before, P Patrick and I had become very close when we were at Alexander Mann. Uh, there was another a business partner there, a chap called Martin Godbold, who was always also part of that um, initial uh, team. Um, and, um, you know, I guess around 95, early 96, it became apparent that um, James didn't have a lot of interest in, in kind of what we were doing in FS. Um, you know, it, it was the start of, it was kind of the beginning of the sort of IT contract um, crazy uh, period. Y2K wasn't far around the corner. Um, you know, James was already building out his IT contract businesses with Michael Flynn and, and uh, a couple of others. Um, I, I'd already run my own business. So I kind of knew, knew, you know, that was the direction I probably wanted to go in. It took me a year or two to persuade Patrick to come with me. Um, but um, it was probably uh, mid, mid, we started talking about it mid 95, early 96. And then um, we left in, uh, in, the, in the spring of 1996. Paint the picture of the first yeah. office and the, the setup of Hanover. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think Anthony may have alluded to some of this when 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 you spoke to him a couple of months ago, Sean. But we we started life um, in a small. Uh, we used to call it the bunker. It was a small un, uh, da, uh, underground um, office, basement office in Covent Garden off Longacre. Um, in those days, there were just four of us. It was myself, Patrick, and um, uh, Martin Godbold, uh, and Anthony had joined us by then, and. Um, you know, we had everything in card index boxes. That was our database, um, blue and red. You know, I was working in uh, in the actuarial space at the time and uh, I had all my uh, notes on um, six by four cards. Um, after a couple of months, we, we, bought a, we bought a big gateway computer that was about the size of my desk. And uh, that sat in the corner uh, for months, really. We didn't really, none of us knew how to work it. Um, we'd leave the office, press a button to see what it did. But... Um, but had no idea. And then uh, eventually we started to hire some uh, young graduates to come and do our research from Imperial College. And they were a bit more clued up about uh, computers and uh, slowly but surely um, we, we learned how to uh, input information into a computer. But um, yeah, um, it was a very different way of working uh, back in, uh, in, the, in the mid late 1990s. I bet. And when you look at your life at that point, Tell us what was the setup at home? How what what responsibilities did you have when you took that risk to no longer have a salary through James Khan and do it yourself? Yeah, uh, very different. Um, uh, by then, uh, you know, I, I I got married in eighty seven. Um, I uh, had three children um, under the age of ten. My youngest daughter had just been born, uh, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we were living. Uh, in a, in a house in Mitcham, nothing particularly glamorous. Um, and um, it was a big risk. Um, we were working six days a week um, and, you know, it was hand to mouth, uh, Sean. Uh, we, we, we were very fortunate. We had one big client. Um, uh, it was a client called Jeremy Rance at uh, Pearl Assurance that had um, um, given us a, a piece of work um, and, you um, you know, we worked on that for a couple of months and that was paying the bills and uh, slowly but surely we managed to find some clients. And, and I think we, we, we did about um, eight or nine hundred thousand in our first year, which is pretty good, you know, back in the day uh, wow. with, uh, with four of us. So um, uh, went from strength to strength. From there. I think we, we doubled up every year for the first uh, first three years. Um, we quickly moved away from Covent Garden to offices in uh, Cannon Street. Um, and uh, started to hire some very uh, bright young grads, um, many of whom are still in the business today. Uh, and um, and it was a lot of fun, you know, as we approached, uh, you know, 99, 2000, was a, it was a lot of fun. Well, looking at your role personally, like how long did you stay on the tools, if you like? How long were you focused on generating revenue and or... And, and at what point did you start thinking about maybe more working on the business than, than in the business? We, we've always operated a kind of player coach model. Um, and uh, I, I continue to do client work right up until about uh, just before lockdown. So up, right up until about 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, and, and, you know, I, I enjoyed it. Um, and even to this day, Sean, you know, as you'll know from talking to Anthony, 
Yeah. Um, m most of the Hanover directors all lead from the front and um, they're, they're all, you know, they all operate that player coach role. So it's, guess everyone's responsibility to still generate revenue, still be meeting customers, still be adding value commercially and not just sitting there and, and, and managing from the sideline. Yeah, that's it. I mean, it's a very flat structure. You know, we haven't got, you know, ivory towers. You know, I, I tend to now focus much more on, you know, hiring strategy acquisitions, um, uh, you know, motivating the staff, appraisers and so on. But um, uh, other than that, you know, we have a, a, a quite a traditional partnership structure where the partners originate in BD, client develop, um, and the work is, is executed by, um, by a really good team of associates. And they're all supported by, you know, admin, finance, marketing, and so on. Love that. Did you always have it in your mind to grow like a headcount-based business and not be like, you know, a boutique lifestyle where you can have a great life, but maybe not realize that kind of growth and wealth and, and potential exit strategies, et cetera? Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, we're still thinking about that particular question, but I'm sure we'll come on to that. But um, look, you know, for... Um, for most of the first, as I said, uh, up until 2014, you know, that wasn't principally my decision. Um, I was, uh, Patrick was the CEO. Um, I was on the wrong side of a 60-40 of a uh, equity split. Um, right. uh, we'd, um, we'd bought uh, Martin out, you know, some years before then. Um, and uh, Patrick, um, you know, was a, a, a great leader in, in his own way. Um, he... Uh, had a very different style to me. Um, and, um, you know, he was a few years older. He, he, he'd moved to Spain. Uh, and, you know, the business was a bit lifestyle-y. Um, you know, we had a, a great business doing sort of four or five million a year. Um, it was making us good money. And um, I, I definitely had a, a desire and a vision to, to expand and to globalize. I'd started to make a few trips abroad. I'd started to see the potential opportunity in the US. Uh, but I, I, until... I could get control of the business. There was not a huge amount I could, I could do from that. We were pulling, starting to pull in slightly different directions towards, um, you know, the, the 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 end of the sort of uh, after the financial crash into sort of 2008, 9, 10. So how, talk us through that then. How did that next way or next horizon come about? And how did you negotiate the, 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 the strategy so that you became, you know, in control? Yeah, and, and then, you know, I think it's a it's a really good story for your for your listeners, Sean. Um, you know, we um, um, I suppose we 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 personally had started to drift apart a little bit, um, and um, uh, Patrick was was more interested in in um, you know pumping up his retirement fund, and um, I was really wanting to grow and expand the business. Um, in the in the late. Um, sort of period noughties i think you call them into sort of 2009-10 we started to create an structure a structure to incentivize uh, some of our <clears throat> managers and leaders so we had effectively a holding company um with three or four um uh co operating companies p and l's effectively that sat within it and, and we, we offered shares out in those operating companies uh to steve and paul and some of the, some of the other directors um, and they, that had started to become quite successful. Um, and the holding company was doing well and was making money. And then in, in 2013, 14, uh, I, um, you know, sat down with Pat and, and said, look, you know, I really, I really want to go in a different direction. I really want to expand the business. Um, he was spending more and more time <clears throat> in Spain. I think he'd probably reached a point where, you know, he wasn't sure about the future of, uh, of um, recruitment and executive search. You know, this was a time when, you know, LinkedIn was starting to get a real handle on the market. Talent acquisition was growing everywhere. Uh, there was a question mark over the long term sustainability of what people in, you know, exec search and recruitment did. And um, I, I made him an offer, um, which he accepted. And uh, I funded that through a, effectively a management buyout vehicle yep. um, over the next five years, which was a, a difficult five year period. Um I was recycling a very significant chunk of my profits to back to him to pay him out. Um, but we got through it and, and we continued to grow. Uh, did he stay in the business for the five years or did he, was he out? No, right. no he, he moved, he moved out and, uh, and, and still, he still continues to work, work today. He's got a, his own small boutique that he runs, uh, I think in, in Spain. 
Um, we don't see, uh, unfortunately, don't see much of each other anymore, but um, uh, he's still working. Um, Is it an amicable exit? Yeah, I think so in the end. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we as I said, we'd, we'd been we'd been very good friends. We, we, were, we were very close. But I mean, it became obvious that we, you know, wanted wanted different things. So we, you know, agreed to part amicably. And uh, I think, I, you know, I, I did the right thing by him and he did the right thing by me. And, um, you know, we, we settled the debt and we didn't miss any payments. And um, he got his money and, you know, um, I was able to do what I wanted with the business. Are you spending hours on LinkedIn and cold outreach and want more business coming to you over your competition? Well, if you're the founder or leader of a recruitment agency, here's what we can do for you. At Hoxo, we'll give you the training, support and resources to take you from what I call an offline recruiter, reliant on posting jobs and sending in mails to open up new customers, ultimately looking like every other recruiter on LinkedIn, to being an online recruiter, being seen by over 25,000 relevant people, driving a 200% minimum increase in engagement on your profile and seeing daily lead lists from LinkedIn that you can follow up with in six weeks time. And if you don't perform, you don't pay. Now, why can we make such a bold results driven promise like this? Well, it's simple. There's two reasons. Firstly, whilst I've been building the RAG podcast, we've actually done what we say we'll do for our clients. In less than two years, we actually built a business generating from zero to over 1 million views per month on LinkedIn, leading to multi-million pound revenues with a sales team of me plus two people without making a single outbound cold call. Second is our track record. Not only have we done it ourselves, but we've helped over 350 agencies and over 4,000 consultants do it as well. It all in the last three years. Now, if that sounds of interest to you, click the link associated to this episode and we can book a call and tell you how we can help. Right. Let's get back to the show. So what year was it then that you took over control, even at the start of the five years? What, when was 2014. that? 2014. 2014. So how did that feel? Was it? Like, can you, nice. you, I bet. I bet. It's a, you know, you, I, I mean, I'm a 50-50 shareholder with my partner and we're, you know, we're best mates before. We've worked together, we've lived together, we've traveled together. The thought of us going down a route of one of us buying the other out and not maybe not even having that same friendship is, is, isn't great. But I, I, no. I can't see that. I can't see that happening, but you never know. Um, but I do know what it's like to share. We did have a third partner at the OXO at the beginning and we bought, and he was my best mate from school. So I have my best mate from school, my best mate from university, and three of us. And we bought, we bought my friend from school out in 2019 after two years of the, running the business because he just wasn't, he wasn't happy. He wasn't fit for purpose. We had different, yeah. everything. We had completely different ways of looking at the world and looking at the business. And, and that was really difficult, but you know, a much, much smaller company, much smaller numbers, I imagine than what you were dealing with. Um, but I've been through something similar and it did. I, I literally, our business just flew and I don't think we did anything different. It was just, we had one, we weren't thinking about that problem anymore like it, as soon as that problem was lifted it just felt like we had more space and time and energy to put into the company which you know seemed to work well for us did you have any of those experiences when you did that you know I think you know I, I talk to people about this all the time in you know life is is short you know and uh, mm -hmm. you need to find um two things for people that work with you work for you one you know what they're good at and, and two, what they love doing. And yeah. if you can combine those two things, then invariably you, you'll end up with a, you know, a, 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 an inspiring, inspired and motivated group of people. In, in Patrick's case, I'm not sure uh, whether he particularly loved it anymore. You know, he, he was good at it. Um, he had other things going on in his life, I think. Um, and, uh, you know, it, 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 we, we were pulling in different directions. When you've got the two principles in a business pulling in a different direction, it's, it's poisonous. So you, you've got to, You've got to find a solution to that um, quickly. Um, and whilst we, you know, we tried to make it work, I, I was fi finding I was spending a lot of my time firefighting. As I said, he had a different management style to me. Um, you know, he was more cut in the '80s style, autocratic management style. You know, I was wanting to give people more um, flexibility, more agility in the way that they worked. Um, uh, he was more of a micromanager and, and it was causing stress and tension in the business. Right. So, you know, we, we, we found, you know, I, I'm pleased we found the right decision. I think it's in the, in the end, it worked for both of us. Um, and, um, um, and I hope he would probably say the same. 
Um, we had a lot of people. I mean, we've been very, very lucky at Hanover um, in that we've been good and, and, and successful at retaining our staff. And we've got a lot of people, as I think as Anthony alluded to, that have been with the firm 10, 15, 20 years. You know, we've worked through a lot of difficult times together, COVID, recessions and everything else. And, um, and loyalty is a very underrated um, uh, principle and um, I think value, um, you know, you know it, it's a common theme that not enough people today stay in the seat long enough to see success. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the number of people I interview that, you know, have been two years, two years, two years, two years, two years, and they're never getting to the point where they're, you know, where they're breaking through some of those uh, challenging and difficult barriers. Um, and if you look at the majority of, of recruiters that stay within a firm for five or 10 years, they're all doing well. They're yeah. typically all doing well over that period of time. So, um, you know, we're, we're very, we're very lucky in that regard. And once you've built that foundation and, and look, look, we're not different to any other firm. And we've got partners at the moment that are finding the market difficult, that are struggling, but you know, they're not bad people just because they're having a tough time. Uh, I think it was, it. um, Sevi Ballesteros said that uh, um, performance was temporary and class was permanent. So if people, if, if you've got good recruiters, a bad course or a bad couple of quarters doesn't make them bad recruiters. You've got to no. stick with them and help them and support them and uh, and find a solution to that. And then they'll repay you with, with that loyalty over time. I love that attitude. It's very similar to, you know, a guy I interviewed a couple of weeks ago, um, Matt Green at IDEX. He, you know... Right. He said the three times he's he's hired a director to launch a brand new division, the markets have, have took a turn like at the same at the same time. So he spent like three months trying to get someone in. And then from the first day they start, the markets like, you know, start to change. And, you know, he, but he always had, you know, a good balance sheet, a good, good a good cash position and and confidence that if you do the right thing by people, it'll pay off and it and it has. And yeah. so many people in our sector. Are just so reactive to that bad couple of weeks or that bad month and they don't give people that time and they don't give people they don't they don't give the business that time to to perform yeah look i mean it's easy to say i mean sometimes you know um with, with the benefit of hindsight's a, a perfect science isn't it but you know when you've seen the cycles come and go you know over a, over a long period of time you you know that those cycles are going to end so um, where perhaps at the moment, you know, cost of living crisis, um, the back end of COVID, the war in Russia, there's a lot of doom and gloom out there. Yeah. And, you know, a, a younger firm, you know, they're tempted to go panic a little bit. Or we've got to cut costs. You know, we've got to stay profitable, um, especially if they've got some debt in the business. And I know we were talking about this earlier. Um, you know, it's a frightening time because, you know, they're not making money. Um, and, and maybe they want to support their staff, but they just can't physically afford to do so. Um, and, you know, I, I think with with the benefit of longevity and, and, and obviously having been through those cycles and, um, um, you know, um, seeing the impact of, of, of being able to hold on to your staff and, and, and the loyalty they show you in doing that, you know, we're, you know, we're, we're a good place from that perspective. And um, as I said to you before, I, I often find my best, periods of growth, you know, when when we're in uh, difficult market conditions, I'm hiring very aggressively at the moment. We're expanding a lot in the US. We're making a, a further acquisitions at the moment. So um, for, kind of follow the masses and do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I like um, it. If you could afford to do so would be my advice. Uh, we've been so going, back, yeah, sorry, mate. Go on. Over look, to you. Going back to your business post taking over, you talked about that the, the US became a big a big feature in, in your, like talk us through the decision there and what, what you actually did to start the U S business. Yeah. Okay. So, um, just before th this journey started with, um, uh, an introduction to a guy called Tom Carter, who, uh, ran a small insurance boutique, um, on the East coast in, in New York. Tom uh, Carter did sound familiar by the way. Like it's one of them names you like, I feel like I know that guy. I don't know. Him, yeah. Really. Um, yeah. He, I mean, Tom he's, um, yeah, he, he, he actually works in, in house now for, for one of our clients, but um, he um, he's a very, uh, very interesting guy. Um, and uh, he was running a small insurance boutique in New York. Um, and, you know, I'd met him through an introduction. Uh, in actual fact, I think we'd met in Bermuda. In fact, we were both there on business. Um, 
and he wanted to sort of grow and scale his business, but he didn't really have the resources. Um, so we came together as a sort of partnership. We, we acquired his business um, and uh, we grew it on the East Coast. Um, I was doing a lot of traveling with one of my other directors, a guy called James Ridd, and uh, he, he came out with me and started to take more uh, control of the sort of day-to-day -day management of that business, working with Tom. Um, uh, and that was great for a few years. Tom, Tom eventually uh, left. Um, he got an opportunity uh, to go and work with one of our clients um, in America. Those sort of roles can pay uh, very well. Um, he had a huge family. He had about seven kids. So I think uh, the money was too tempting for him. Um, but uh, we continue to, to grow that uh, that insurance boutique. And um, um, it was difficult. You know, James at the time was living between London and Portugal and running a business in New York. But um, wow. we kind of made it work and we kept it going. Um, and then, um, as you'll know from the from the story with with Anthony, um, I also started to reconnect with him. Um, he was running another uh, very small uh, boutique, sort of three person wealth management business on the West Coast um, in uh, just outside L.A. in Redondo. Uh, and um, he had a, a silent partner that had put a bit of money behind him, um, yeah. but he was really struggling. He was at a funny old office in the back streets of L.A., um and um was really was really finding it difficult but we had stayed close he, he he'd spent 10 years at hanover we were good friends um so i, I acquired the, the his business partner's share um and um and then we started to scale the west coast business we moved into nice offices we started to hire some good people the hanover brand helped because people could see it was part of a bigger global operation right. uh and um that's Business started to do really, really, really well uh, off the back of a couple of big, big clients. Um, uh, and um, in 2018, we we crashed those two businesses together, the, the West Coast Wealth Management and the, and the East Coast Insurance Business. And um, James Ridd uh, moved to America along with another of my young directors, a guy called Alex Curtis, um, who's a, a fantastic leader. Um, and they uh, formed a new uh, U.S. Um, PL with Anthony and a bit and it just worked. The business took off uh, and I think it's grown fivefold in as many years. So um but it's been a tremendous success and, and, that, and that's very much around uh finding the right leadership team. Um I think you know one of the things I learned from James Khan and, and he, he probably still does to, to this day is to find great people that are you know really good or better than you, um, put them into leadership roles and then you know give them give them enough rope. Um, and trust them to get on with the job. Um, and, I, and I've always done that. It's not always worked. But in this particular case, the mix of skills that we found, we'd exported a number of our staff uh, over to the US uh, from uh, from the UK. Um, and uh, we'd hired a number of uh, Americans in the domestic market. Um, and it gave us a little bit of an edge. We were a bit different. We had a multicultural feel. It were people from Europe, from France, from the UK, from the US. Uh, two really dynamic young directors working with Anthony with his his sort of experience, and um, it's been a it's been a w wonderful success success story as you you know you, as you heard from your um your session with um with Anthony. Yeah, well, being honest from your side, because obviously I've heard his side of the alcohol addiction and the impact that had on him, and you know it sounded like a really um, big decision for you to take that risk almost on him. Like you know you knew him before you. Was he honest with you about the impact that it had on his life? And yeah, I, 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 I absolutely knew. Um, I absolutely knew about uh, his history, and we'd known each other for <clears throat> thirty years. Um, and uh, I had a, a huge amount of respect for Anthony. Um, he's got one of the best work rates of anyone you'll ever meet. Um, right, he's yeah. extremely passionate about what he does. And, and, I, and I guess, you know, in being totally candid with you, and I expect he, I don't think he would mind me saying this, but um, he actually relapsed the week before uh, we um, uh, we were due to complete on the deal. Wow. Um, and, um, um, and he disappeared for three days. Um, it was a long time ago now. And I think it was the last time, the last, certainly the last time that happened. Yeah. Uh, but... Um, you know, um, um, I love Anthony and he's a great friend and, um, um, you know, he gave me some really big assurances and, you know, 
his journey, as everyone's heard, has been a, a, a really interesting and uh, inspiring journey. So we completed the deal and, and he's never let me down again. Love that. Love that. But did you wobble at that point? Were you doubting, fuck, what have I done here? <laughs> made a, made well, a I, I wobbled when I couldn't find him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he resurfaced. Um, but... Um, yeah, um, look, and you know, he he was very very honest in in, in his his podcast uh, about that journey, um, and um, you know, I think look, addiction is a is a is a big problem for a lot of people in society, especially in yeah. America. Um, uh, um, you know, as a massive addiction with prescription drugs and all sorts of things, uh, problem there. Uh, but it elsewhere, as it is elsewhere in the world, you know, alcohol is uh, is an addictive drug. Um, you know, some people managed to, to find the right balance. Some people don't touch it and some people can't. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if you recognize, uh, hopefully by the time you're in your fifties as he is, you know, you, you can recognize whether it's um, something that you should play with or not. And in his case, it's definitely not. Yeah. And in our industry as well, where like, you know, it's yeah. very alcohol dominated, you know, most people's company events, client events, relationship management it's like go and go and have a glass of wine with him go and have a beer with with them go and take them for lunch you know promotions incentives you know it, it's a very very work hard play hard sector that, that that revolves around letting off steam with alcohol um i love the way he explained how like he still goes to all these events he still does all these things with the business but he he just gets to bed at a time he leaves when he needs to leave and he gets on with it and i just thought yeah you know, it's really refreshing Really refreshing how how he you know he put it. Has there been any? Would you say the, how does the business respond to that? Are they is everyone just like yeah we get it? Is there any, has there ever been any questions around why is he not getting involved or no um, no no I mean he's uh, you know rock solid and um, no I don't think um, anyone questions that. I mean people are aware of his history. He doesn't uh, typically volunteer to go on you know big boozy dinners and lunches. I think he leaves that to the two younger partners. Mm. Um, uh, Alex certainly enjoys a drink. He's a, he's a, he's a typical Welshman. So there's no problem there. Um, uh, James also enjoys a glass of wine. So it's not, it's not something he imposes on the business. It's just his personal choice. Um, and certainly I've been there at times when we've been out for lunches and Christmas parties and, you know, he'll do his best and he'll be positive and he'll have fun and, you know, and he'll leave at 10 o'clock. Yeah. Um, and, um, it, it, they're not environments where he 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 finds it enjoyable, and, and he he would say the same, and he probably did when you spoke to him. Um, but um, you know he, he'll 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 do what it takes to keep people happy and motivated. So yeah, um, well yeah, I love that story. So you get Anthony rolling, and then you mesh the two businesses together, East Coast and West Coast. So take us on that journey. Um. Well, we so we had um, we had a, a number of, uh, of of young staff on the east coast. Uh, we had a couple of experience. We'd, we'd already moved a couple of our UK partners. Um, uh, a very successful uh, female partner, a lady called Kate Furman, who who's, uh, uh, comes from French actually, but uh, worked in the insurance market with a lot of experience. Uh, we had two or three other people on the east coast with a lot of experience. Uh, James and Alex have moved out. Um, and on the West Coast, we had kind of Anthony with a lot of experience and then this sort of relatively small army of of, uh, of um, young associates that, you know, we'd really hired kind of from an eclectic mix of backgrounds that didn't have a lot of experience. Right. So it, it was, uh, in a way, that mixing the East and the West Coast and bringing the two things together you know, was a was was a marrying up of youth and energy and age and experience to, to right. create that that the business that we have today, which um, you know, which is a really really nice mix of of of, of those things, and that's probably the same. Probably here in in Europe, you know, our our, our business model is a little bit different, um, but in America, it's 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 a, it you know, it's a very young, dynamic, thrusting, growing um business and uh has that real excitement about it um i love going out there and going out there again in july and um you know i'm really looking forward to spending time with them all i bet what what what's the reality though of, of trying to create a culture across you know i don't know the exact mileage of the i know it's about a three hour flight from east to west six is it six sorry yeah 
Wow. I'm sure. Is it? Oh, I, I, oh, three, well, three. Six, yeah. It was years yeah, ago was, I went from Atlanta to San Diego, and in my head it was three. But yeah, I think yeah, it's New, the, time, New, the time difference is three. That's the difference. Yeah, the time difference. New, is three. Yeah, times is three. New York, LA is about five and a half, six. It's about, it's about yeah. the same as it is from London to New York almost. Not yeah, it's different. like going from here to, you know, almost Dubai. Like you're going to Egypt mm. or you're going to Morocco it's or something yeah. further than that. It's a, it's a yeah. big distance. So, you know, Anthony's on the West Coast running his own little shop. You've got these guys coming from the UK with big ideas on the East Coast. Even culturally, those sides of the countries are completely different. I, I lived in Redondo for a while and I've I've been to New York a lot. And the, I think I think the East Coast is mirrors a lot more European. It's a bit fast paced. It's quite aggressive. And the West is more... It's like going to Sydney or something. It's very chill. What tell us talk us through, what were the biggest challenges there? Like how did and, and what was your part in it? Because you're in the UK, you, you you're investing in people to make things happen. What was that journey like? Well, I um, I mean, um in, in the first year or two, I, I spent a lot of time um in the US. I was flying out, you know, almost on a bi-monthly basis. Hmm. And um I really wanted to understand Anthony's business. Um, uh, you know, I, I knew the insurance market. So, you know, I, I, I'd already spent quite a bit of time on the East Coast with Tom and with James and the, and the team up there. But I really wanted to understand how Anthony did his job, um, what his market was like. You know, the wealth management market in the US is very different to, um, you know, to the, to the wealth and asset management market over here. Um, so it, it, literally, I'd go out there for a week and go on roadshows with him. And we'd go and, and, and sit there and I'd sit and watch him you know, interview, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 candidates uh, to really understand, um, you know, the T12 market and, and how it all operated. It's very transactional. It's like moving, almost like moving big teams. Uh, the fees are huge. Um, but, you know, you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to to land some of those, um, some of those big, uh, big projects. Over 70 founders have launched their businesses on RecruitUp in the UK, USA, and the UAE. One of them is Kyle Winterbottom, the founder of Orbition Group. Also an Hoxo Academy client, Orbition are a niche talent consultancy operating exclusively in data analytics and AI. They work across the UK, Europe, and the USA. In just over two years of trading, the company has gone on to build a huge client base globally in the data analytics space. Kyle is voted one of the top 100 most influential people in the market, and he's built an industry-leading podcast like The Rag with over 20,000 listeners in 128 countries. Before joining the Recruit Hub, Kyle spoke to at least five other support companies, and all of them wanted him to either invest a lot of his own money up front, but then he'd only get a very small percentage of the money that he'd invested against the cost to start, or they just wanted to take too much equity. For Kyle, Recruit Hub was the right option. The company has been able to lean on Recruit Hub very heavily since starting, and Kyle and Edmund and the team have got such strong relationships, and it's all contributed to the growth of the business. Since launching, Orbition has benefited from the tech startup, the planning, the legal, the finance, the incorporation. And Kyle's been able to focus on the bits that he knows best. That's content production, that's global data, community building, and generating huge fees. Now, if Kyle had known about Recruit Hub earlier in his career, he said he'd have launched much faster. So anyone who's listening to this episode thinking, I think I could do this, you really need to read Kyle's story. And you can read Kyle's story and find out more about Recruit Hub via the link attached to this episode. Right, let's get back into it. But in terms of trying to marry that as one business, what problems did you face? Um... I, I think that there's 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 always you know there was a slightly different culture in the on the east coast than there was on the west coast. Um, logistically, obviously, as you say, you know, flying from one to the other uh, can be a problem. But I mean, as you know, if you've lived in America, they don't think anything of getting on a plane and flying, yeah. you know, three, four, five, six hours. They do it on, almost on a daily, weekly basis. Um, and um, the 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 chat the some of the early challenges we had were. You know, we we didn't have a lot of clients. We had a small number of clients. Our brand wasn't well known as it is over here. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the the American clients were not particularly um, uh, clued up or understood the sort of um, three stage executive search process. So you know, we had to create a much more dynamic, agile model um, and we had to use a language that, that they understood. And as we started to, to win more and more exec search business, you know, we would start to use words like, you know, engagement fee rather than first stage retainer fee. 
um, you know, and uh, that, that, that could get a head around that. Okay, I'm going to pay you, you know, five or 10,000 to, you know, to lock in that and that's going to come with that. But so we, we, we kind of changed the model um, and, um, you know, we, um, we, we recognized, I mean, the reason I entered that market um, back in the day was largely because I had um, seen a, a huge opportunity in a, in a market that was 10 times the size of the UK where the service proposition was really poor, Sean. So, you know, yeah. there weren't really, really, there weren't really good quality mid-tier, you know, high-end search and selection businesses. You, you know, on the one hand, you had the Shreks that kind of dominated everything at C-Suite, you know, the Corn Ferries, Hydrix, uh, MBSs and so on. And at the other end, there were like armies of kind of what they call mom and pop shops. Yeah. You know, two, three person businesses. And they were like just sitting in a, in a home office and just pinging CVs out, hoping something's going to land one day. No operating costs, no overheads. So in, in the middle, there was this massive, great big vacuum of, you know, um, of, of demand um, that wasn't being met. And, and we could we felt we could fill that demand. Um, and uh, and I think our clients, we were very lucky to have a couple of very big clients, uh, one of which at the time was First Republic Bank, which unfortunately, yeah. is, as everyone knows, has, uh, has got caught up in the recent uh, SBB fiasco and has now been sold off. Um, but, um, you know, we did a lot for those institutions uh, and uh, they really liked our culture. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm sure we're going to talk about culture, but they... Um, we had a, a real nice mix of youth and experience. We had a real nice mix, multicultural background. Anthony would turn up to meetings in his blue pinstripe suit. Um, you know, the Americans liked the sort of British business feel. Um, you know, he, he would say that, that his accent gives him an extra 15 or 20 seconds on the phone. Yeah. Um, so we really played up to these things. And, um, you know, and then we were able to, to hire a lot of, you know, bright young Americans cut to come in and do the, the heavy lifting of the, the associate work. So most of the, the origination is actually done by, um, you know, experienced revenue generators that we've exported from the UK. Um, and, I, and I know a lot of my peers and a, and a lot of other recruitment firms have fallen flat in America. They've gone to America. They tried to build um, a business over there. Um, and it's really hard and, and, and get it, getting it right. You know, I, I think we were lucky. We got the right place at the right time. But most importantly, we had the right team. You, know, you, you, put, you put the right people into any situation and, and, and you know, they can overcome any challenges. Um, yeah, agreed. Agreed. And, yeah. So that's that, that, that. It wasn't one thing, Sean. You know, I don't think it was the bigger brand. It was the dynamic team. Um, we had like really nice offices. We had a real multicultural mix great work ethic, fabulous culture of values, lots of energy. It's it's all of those things as a whole that made the business fly. And once you get that momentum, you know, and you get that quorum of people that, are, you know, really work well together, it's really easy to build a business off those foundations. Yeah. yeah? And, yeah. Um, yeah. Sorry, I hope that answers you. Does that answer your question? No, no I, get, I get it. I get it. So you mentioned we'll get onto culture. Tell me... Like, what type of culture do you believe in? Like, what's the culture that you're trying to create, that you have created, that you're constantly trying to create? Like, what, how would you describe what, what Hanover... Well, I mean, our, you, know, our, 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 um, you know, our values, our values, our values were chosen by our staff. Um, trust, collaboration, you know, innovation, agility, probably loyalty sort of sits behind all of that. Um, and um, I... I there's a big difference between management and leadership. So, you know, leadership is about motivating, encouraging, inspiring. Management's largely about data management, managing data numbers. Um, I wanted to, you know, build a business where the culture was collegiate and supportive. I wanted to find people that, you know, understood that abundant mindset, that things work well when they worked as hard for their brand, for each other as they do for themselves. Um, you know, I talk a lot about sort of a scarcity and an abundant mindset. And if you go way back to the early days of recruitment, there were recruiters that would literally hide CVs in drawers so no one could get them because, you know, the cake was only so big and it was a race to the finish and who could get over the line. Whereas people that have got an abundant mindset just recognize that all working together, you just make the cake bigger. There's enough to go around, right? 
Of course there is. Yeah, of course there is. Um, so, you know, I, I, you know, I, I don't, you know, I don't see myself as a manager. I see myself as a facilitator, as someone who can create a platform and a brand, um, a brand that can take people to where they want to go. They want to do senior level work. They want to do executive search. They want to offer a really high level of service. And, and, um, and a culture that, that reflects who they are. If they work for us, they've got to reflect our culture. Our, ref, our culture reflects them. And, and when, when I hire people into the business, you know, I probably spend more time talking about those things than I do about what have you built? What's your market? Because if you don't get those bits right, then, you know, you're, you're doomed to failure. And more businesses fold by making bad hires and rotating their staff than, you know, than they do by anything else. So yeah. it's, it's like it's not a case of convincing someone to, to come and join Hannah. It's a case of finding the right people that, you know, buy into those values and, you know, where our brand is right for where they are. Um, so it's, 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 it's hugely important. And, and I think that's one of the reasons, you know, there aren't very many firms that have grown to our size and scale without taking a big chunk of change from private equity or from banks or whatever. And we've done it organically because I think we've been very careful to, to nurture our brand and the culture and the people. And we've inspired loyalty from the people that work for us. I want, what I want, you, I, sorry, when mate, it comes to your management of cash and reinvestment of cash, though, what, what have you had to do to ensure that you can grow to 100 heads without taking external rev, uh, capital? Well, I mean, you know, I, you know, I, as the majority shareholder, it's down to me to continually put capital back into the business, which I which I've done. Um, you know, I don't you know, I've got minority shareholders that are at a different time and stage in their life. And, um, you know, they need to draw their dividends. Um, and, you know, I'm 60 now. I'm, I'm financially secure. And I don't need to do that. Um, so, you know, I, I reinvest a lot of my own capital. Um, I see the opportunity. i back myself and I back the people that work for us and, um, you know, acquiring, we, we haven't gone out and acquired 40, 50 person businesses. We've gone out and acquired five to 10 person businesses that are struggling, um, you know, to, to, to scale their businesses because they don't have the capital. Um, and, um, the, the their owner managed businesses, the owners are doing 101 different things. Um, they don't have the time to hire, to train, to develop, and they need a mothership. So, you know, we operate as a mothership, as a facilitator. We, we provide all of that resource. I'm probably talking to three or four, um, you know, smaller firms. And, and, I, and I think that our, our industry is, is ripe for a massive amount of consolidation. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, especially when we get, you know, deep sort of recessions that we're, we're sort of experiencing at the moment to a degree. Um, those small businesses can can bolt on to Hanover. They can benefit from the elevated P multiple that a hundred person business has, and they can benefit from the resources and infrastructure we can provide for them to help them scale. Um, so it, it's a no brainer, really. It's a logical it's a logical thing to do. I don't, I, I often I often look to acquire fifty percent, not fifty one percent, because I don't want people to feel that they're owned. I want people to feel that they're in partnership. And um, and that makes a massive difference. You know, they've got their voices is, 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 is as big as mine. Their opinion matters as, as much. Is that um, still part of your is that part of your strategy in the future then to continue that acquisition? Yeah, that, yeah ab absolutely. Yeah. But sort of buy and build and scale that yeah. way. And uh, we've done that with City CV. We've done that with Ezra Pendant. We did that with uh, Talent ID. We did it originally with with Opus Consulting at McCain, Hanover, US. We did it with Leader Finder. You know, we've is done that, it. Is the plan time. to keep... Would you prefer to rebrand them as Hanover or does it depend on the so, Some we have, Sean. So, you know, Anthony's business, for example, because we crashed two things together and we moved out, you know, we he benefited from the exportation of a lot of talent from here. So, you know, that business in the end became a, became a Hanover-owned subsidiary. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but um, like City CV, for example, Victoria McLean's business, uh, that, um, you know, is bolted on to Hanover. Uh, they've got a very good brand in their own right around sort of CV writing, coaching, profile building. She does a huge amount of work, especially with women in business. Uh, she runs a lot of webinar series on things like, you know, supporting women through the men menopause, imposter syndrome. Um, and, that, and that's a wonderful alignment to our brand. 
um, and you know that is that is kept as a as a, as a separate um, separate brand. Um, but uh, uh, Victoria gets the benefit of, of our advice of our, of our cross selling opportunity. She works very closely with our leadership solutions business, uh, with our executive search partners, and um, you know and it, and it works pretty well. Um, it's not without challenges, not without difficulties, but we're getting there. And what's the benefit? For people listening who are maybe not quite at the same you know, level of their journey, they're in the earlier days, but they want to grow. Why would going down a buy and, um, buy and build buy and build strategy alongside your organic growth? Why? What's the benefit of that like for, in, in simple terms? Well, it's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very difficult to, to, uh, to achieve any meaningful value in a small owner managed firm. You know, you, you you are, I'm sure, I don't know who your partners are, Sean, but you are the RAG podcast, right? If you take you out of um, Hoxo, the, the, the RAG podcast doesn't exist because it's your it, okay? So it's yeah. the same with a small owner managed uh, um, recruitment business. Often it's built in the image of the founder. You might have two or three business development people and, and, a, and a raft. Of, you know, if, if you write the, biz, the, the, the owner a check for, you know, a couple of million bucks, you know, they ride off into the sunset. You're left with nothing. Yeah, yeah. So they, they can't. That that proposition has no value, and th- and those people know that. And our industry in this country certainly um, is made up of thousands of firms like that. Yeah, of course. The, the number of firms billing less than a million or between one and two million make up about eighty percent of the market, right? Um, you know, when when if they bolt on to a to a bigger mothership, I'm not saying Hanover is one option. There are many others. Yeah. You know, James has done it very successfully with Hamilton Bradshaw. Um, what they get is they get the benefit of scale. So their P multiple, you know, their dollar of profit suddenly becomes worth eight or nine or 10 as opposed to two. Yeah. Because they, they get a, they, they leverage on the P, P multiple and they get the benefit of scale. So, you know, they're then one part of a, of a much bigger entity. So they're not so much the issue in it. And they can scale their business because they've got the benefit of, finance, marketing, admin support, infrastructure, resource, um, brand, all of those things. You know, Anthony went from three people to 15 people in the space of, you know, 18 months where he couldn't do, he couldn't grow to four people for the previous five years because he had a global brand behind him. We were able to fund smarter offices, uh, you know, and and it was much easier to attract people into into that business. It's hard to attract people into a small owner managed business because they go the first question they ask is what's my career path you know if you look at um you know i, I like stephen covey as a quote sort of begin with the end of mine so here i am i'm 30 i'm 30 where am i going to be when i'm 40 what's my destination grade begin with the end of mine look around well hang on there's no one here i can you know there's one owner manager who am i going to learn from what am i going to learn how can i grow how can i develop what's my roadmap yeah i agree I agree. I think um, I think that's an amazing way of putting it. By the way, that's so so clear. And there's so many people listening to this show with those um, with those problems and in that exact scenario. And there's people that maybe haven't even launched yet that are going to become that. Um, what about what if people said to you though? But but then I won't own my own business. I won't feel like you know part of the reason we leave firms and start our own is because we want to have that full autonomy of our life. And we want to grow in our own way. And we want to put our own stamp on it. I think, I think perception, I mean, I've got my whole network. I'm working with 350 agencies right now and 80% of them fit the bill that you've just mentioned. A lot of them would say, you know, they don't want to be managed. They don't want to have a, someone telling them what to do. They don't want to have to answer to anyone. So how did, you know, what, what is, well, what that, is that, a true that, relationship like? Yeah, I mean, look, my, me- my message to those people is that the whole point of a 50-50 partnership, if we go down that route, is they're not. They're equal partners. I, I don't, look, I've got a-, a-, a big business to look after and a big family. I don't, um, don't want to run their business. I want to help facilitate their growth. Uh, There's a massive difference. This is, again, a leadership management argument, right? Yeah, yeah. It's about, look, what do you need, Sean, in your 10-person recruitment business to scale? Well, then let us provide that for you. I don't want to come and manage your people or manage your business. I just want you to tell me what tools you need and for us to help facilitate that. And, you know, I think it was uh, Jean-Paul Getty said, look, do you want, you know, monetarily, do you want to own, you know, 100% of nothing or 1%? Would you take 1% of Google or 100% of nothing? Yeah, true. 
Oh, you know, but the, 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 the argument is that have 50% of something that's meaningfully valuable rather than 100% of something that's not really worth a lot. And you're going to be chasing your own tail for years. What you can achieve on your own as an owner manager in five or 10 years, you know, we could do together in one or two years. You know, we could scale much more quickly um, with, with, those, um, with those resources. But I mean, I think that we are, you know, at, at, that we're getting to a point now where, you know, I, I'm 60. I'm, I'm now very much looking at the, you know, finding the next generation of leaders that will take the business forward, you know, the next 30 years. Um, and, and, I, and I'm sure that, you know, there will be a capital event at some point because we've reached a stage where, you know, we probably can't grow much more without getting some significant capital behind us. Um, you know, I probably want to be looking at bigger acquisitions and, uh, uh, and it's difficult to do that with, um, you know, with your own resources. So, um, Agreed. you know, that, that time is coming and, uh, you know, we've launched share option schemes, EMI schemes, wealth creation schemes. So again, so, you know, all of our, all of our partners and staff, um, you know, feel part of the, the wealth that they're helping to create. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, so let's look at the future now then. So like what, you got any like specific timelines around your own life and involvement? And, you know, you said, you've said you're 60 years old. You're in a really comfortable position. I get the feeling, James, that you love it though. I get an, inst- I'm feeling an energy from you that there's still a lot of energy there for the business. You're not sat there like talking halfway out. You sound like you're as energetic as a 25 year old founder. That yeah. 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 You, you, you tell my wife that, um, uh i do i do i do love it and it's a it's a reason it is a big question i'm not i'm not looking at hanging up my boots anytime soon and in terms of longevity i mean you know touch with i I obviously want to live a long time but um but um you know i I, um yeah i I think it's about it's about a managed handover you know you know you've got to you know eventually you know i've seen business where the owner is still you know you know trying to run a business at 75 and you know, look, I, you know, however much energy you've got, I think if you're trying to run a business at 75, you know, it's hard to attract people in there. The generational gap is so huge. And, you know, you need young minds to take young minds forward. Um, and um, so it, it's, it's very much, you know, my real focus now, you know, across the world is, is finding the leaders of the future and then using the next, you know, I think it's probably a two or three year window um, to, 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 to build and develop those leaders, um, you know, and to, and to have a, a business. I mean, when, when my mum sold her for the prep school, you know, she wanted to leave a, a legacy that, you know, she was to found uh, the values, the culture. Of the, and I'm very much the same with Hanover. You know, I put, you know, pretty much half my entire life into, into building um, and dr- driving this business. And I don't actually know what I'm going to be like, uh, when when I stop because I'm a terrible golfer, as Anthony will tell you, um, and I'm going to need to want to do other things. And so whether I operate, you know, in an angel capacity or I continue to um, support Hanover or, or other recruitment businesses from a consultative perspective, you know, that might be a, a, an opportunity. But you know, for the next couple of years, I think we'll get to the bottom of this cycle. We're going for a 2024, 25. I think going to be very good years for our industry. And I want to use that time to really bed down the, the leadership team that are going to form the, you know, the future of the business moving forward. Love it. James, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Um, you, uh, you know, you, you ooze energy, you ooze, you, you're calm, you're calculated, you've thought about, you know, your business is very well put together. Um, I think people listening to this have le- will have learned a lot, will have sparked a lot of thoughts. Um, if anyone is listening and wants to reach out to you, whether it's to talk about your growth strategy and whether they could be part of it or just to pick your brains on things because they feel like you're someone they could relate to. Is that OK? If they if I tag you on LinkedIn, would you would you be open to people dropping you a quick message? And Absolutely. Out? Open open door policy. I'll talk to anybody um, at, at any time. So um, right. um, I'll always try and find time in my diary and. Um, I've got a really good EA, uh, Jerry, that's looked after me for about 14 years. And uh, if I can't find the time, she certainly will. Love it. Um, well, look, we'll, ta- we'll tag you in everything. Um, and I'd like to get you back on in a couple of years, perhaps at the time where you're thinking a bit closer to, you know, the reality of, of, of that 
buyout or whatever, whatever, whatever exit eventuates. We'd love to see you, you know, find out more about that journey. But in the meantime, stay safe, look after yourself and, and keep doing the great things you do. Sure. Thanks very much. Really enjoyed it. Cheers, mate. Bye Speak to you soon. Thank you, as always, for listening to today's show. I truly, truly hope that you got value from it. That's the only reason I take time every week is to ensure that my audience, future and existing recruitment owners are learning from each other to make this industry that I love so much stronger. Today's episode was brought to you by Hoxo Media. I am the CEO and founder of Hoxo Media, and we are the world's leading content marketing and personal branding agency for recruitment businesses specifically. So we are working with over 200 agencies and 2,000 recruiters right now, both managing the brands, producing content, building written video podcast content for niche recruitment agencies all over the world, as well as coaching at a desk level individual recruiters in your businesses, how to be better on LinkedIn. That's how to brand themselves. That's how to produce content. That's how to use the opportunity on LinkedIn to get traffic to their profiles and turn that into business. We're coaching people all over the world every single day. If any of that sounds of interest, please do visit www.hoxomedia.com or drop me, Sean Anderson, a personal message on LinkedIn. I would love to talk to you. I'll see you soon.